on uh, the, the 10 acre development site along with the budget, sort of do that as a combined um, process, and then I'll follow that up with an update on the school budget. And uh, if, if everything goes as planned, we'll be right on target to get out of here four or earlier if we talk Three. fast. Three, maybe, Wyatt says. So we'll, <laughs> we'll see. Um, but before we get started, there are a couple of school board members that I want to recognize, and then I'll turn it over to Wyatt to, um, to introduce some folks that are here from council. But I want to uh, thank Greg Anderson, our vice chair of the school board, is here, and also Shannon Litton is here. So thank you both for being here on this beautiful day. And uh, Wyatt, you want to make some comments? Well, thank you, Peter. Yes, my name is Wyatt Shields. I'm the city manager for the City Post Church. Um, after Peter's update on the school on the high school project, I'll do a quick run through of the budget and how it ties into how we're financing the high school. And so we'll make that connection. This obviously is part of our ongoing Sunday series to keep people updated on the high school project, but we've married it with the budget this time. So we have uh, Mayor Tarter is here. Uh, co uh, Council Member Dave, <laughs> Council Member Dave, Dave Snyder is here. Uh, Vice Mayor Mary Beth Connolly is here. Councilmember Phil Duncan and Councilmember Letty Hardy. Uh, so thank you all for being here today. Um, before we get started, maybe we just to understand the, our audience a little bit. Um, who is here kind of mostly to hear about the high school project? Um, okay. Right. <laughs> and who is here mostly interested in the budget for FY19? So, yeah, okay. So probably mostly the, the high school project, and um, so we'll try to keep our time focused on that. I do have slides on the budget, but we'll go through those briskly. Um, and uh, folks outside of the city limits, okay, and, and folks inside the city limits who are here. So basically our, our full audience today are, pe are people inside the city. We have had good attendance from county residents interested in the high Dr. Dennon, why don't you get us started off? Yeah, great. Well, thank you all again for being here. Um, we have had uh, a number of these Sunday series now. I forget what the number is. Roughly. Um, and the last time we were here, uh, we did a presentation uh, indicating that we were past our schematic design and moving into design development. Um, I'm happy to report that we received the design development documents from Gilbane. Stantec and Quinn Evans team earlier this month and right now we are in the process of reviewing those de design development documents uh, and we'll do some work over the next couple of weeks to make sure that the design development documents represent the conversations we've had with the community, represent the conversations we've had with the staff uh, and the like. There has not been substantive change to the plans from the SDs, from the schematic design uh, but there have been some, and I outlined some of those the last time we were here and showed a few renderings of what some things might be looking like with respect to where the cafe is, um, the entrance to the library and the media center, and then thinking about a little bit more uh, on the fifth floor in that outdoor space. So today, um, I, I thought I would focus a little bit differently. Uh, instead of thinking about what's on the interior of the building, thinking about a little bit more uh, what's going to be on the outside. So recently, um, our team from Gilbane, Stantec, and Quinn Evans um, held a meeting, or were part of a meeting with uh, the Architectural Advisory Board and also the Planning Commission, and they shared some information with them uh, around um, sort of what does the landscape look like on the outside of the building? Um, what is it really going to start to begin to look like when uh, things get set in terms of materials and uh, benches and the like? So I thought what I would share is just a couple of pieces, again, around the exterior design. Um, this should be a very familiar image to you. Um, this is the back side of the uh, high school, the north side, if you will. Um, these three levels are um, all triple height volume that represent where the gymnasiums are. So this is the auxiliary gym and the main areas. And you'll remember um, that in the design, sort of the third floor is where the academic uh, wings begins. We've got the third floor uh, starting here, fourth floor, and fifth floor. So you'll know right away that this is sort of the fat bar of the building um, as opposed to the skinny bar because the skinny bar is four floors. Um, but this is the fat bar of the building um, and looking at it from the uh, perspective of the field. 
couple things of note that right off the bat I want to make sure um, you're aware of is you'll note that the grade down here, and these are the bleachers that are existing, um, is significantly different than what the grade is when you come down that ramp from uh, the parking lot now. So now when you pay for a ticket, you're kind of up at this point almost, and then you're kind of making this loop around, and then there's a rather steep grade that comes down uh, to where uh, the bleachers are. This design, um, right in this point, is going to be the deepest area of excavation that will happen in this building. So, it'll, so it will go down two more stories below here. But as they dig that out, there will be some significant shifts in the topography around the stadium and around this corner to really flatten it out and really allow the grade to um, be much more gentle. There are a couple of things that I want to make sure also to point out in this that have come up in the community and I, I want to be super clear about today in the Sunday series, and that is um, accessibility of the stadium field and all of the sports facilities and the interiors of the building. Um, they will all be ADA accessible. Um, and what's nice about this regrade re in the back is it's actually going to be easier for people perhaps that need extra support getting down to not have to take this really steep route all the way down into uh, where those bleachers are. This is a promenade area. It's fairly flat and fairly wide. Um, and then once you get down into the bleachers, um, there will be also uh, ADA capacity there. So um, one thing I want to just make sure that I can sort of squash in terms of rumors that might be out there is that this will be a fully ADA accessible building and all of the external facilities will also be ADA accessible. Just to orient you a little bit um, to where we are, um, one of the things you'll note is that we have named this, this road, this is the loop road that starts over here on Route 7 and loops around this direction and goes back here to Haycock Road. That is now called Mustang Alley. It's no longer School Street A, um, which, is, which is sort of exciting. So um, as you travel down Mustang Alley and come across the one earth of the school, as soon as you hit this point, there is, uh, this will continue to be Mustang Alley out to Route 7. But if you were to take a right into the parking lot of the Henderson, um, in the Henderson School, this is called Husky Loop. Um, so it's kind of a nice combination of the two schools. You've got Mustang Alley and Husky Loop. This, of course, is the, uh, the new building. Um, this is the, uh, the two bars that I was referencing, and then the heart of the school in the middle. This is the existing stadium field. Again, that won't be changing. The existing baseball field is staying and we'll have new softball fields, new tennis courts, new multi-use field in the back that will be synthetic turf, as well as additional parking here. You might remember that this is where our buses currently are parked and we'll be moving the buses off site. So just that's a quick orientation. Um, the landscape plan um, is starting to come together. And so we are looking at um, native plants, native trees. Um, and so some of the native species that we're looking at are block elm, willow oak, American elm, red maple, Virginia pine, and flowering dogwoods. And it'll be a little bit hard to see, but this is a coded uh, map. So each of these, um, for example, block gum is one, willow oak is two, most important for what I'm about to say next is four are the red maples. Um, so you'll start to see where these numbers are and they correspond to the to current planning of where the trees are gonna be. The reason that I wanted to point out four being the red maples is that this is a bank of red maples here, and this is a bank of red maples here, and a couple here. And what was, um, I, I just thought it was kind of cool, and I'm sort of sharing it with you because I, I found it to kind of be fun, is that in the fall, these red maples turn really brilliant red, and during football season that will be played out on the stadium field as our visitors come in, they'll be swarmed by a sea of red trees around them as well as our, our team. So we thought that was kind of a cool play on the way that um, they're starting to design this. Um, one of the things that we're really excited about as a consequence of um, doing this site development work and looking at these trees is we actually have achieved and exceeded the tree canopy that we had put into the RFP uh, for our developers. Um, we had an aspirational number out there. We weren't able to achieve the aspirational number, but we did get to what we said we would get to in the RFP, and that was part of the work from the Tree Commission influencing us as well, and we're really excited about uh, their advocacy. So you'll see a lot of trees on the site. Uh, some other things that you'll see here are our bioretention plantings. Um, one of the things that 
this building speaks to me about is this whole idea of environmental sustainability. And that also means how are we dealing with storm water across, uh, across this site. And one of the ways that we anticipate um, working through some of the storm water issues are to work through these bioretention fields. So you'll see um, river birch will be planted along, um, along areas, along, uh, bioretention plantings along with some hardscape um, will look kind of like this. And you'll also see um, some other landscaped areas that would become kind of no mow zones, areas that won't be necessarily attacked with um, weed eaters or any kind of cutting. Um, and where you see these numbers on, these, uh, on this uh, area plan, uh, for example, three and one, this is where you would see sort of these bioretention plantings that are kind of low, and there would also be some river birch in there. And so this corner at, um, and this is called Mustang Way, and this is called Husky Trail, um, at this corner you would see sort of a swale that would, that would incorporate some of these low plantings along with river birch to capture some of the runoff um, from, our, from our fields and, and other areas. There are bioretention fields here, 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 and then as we work around to the front, you'll see one here, here, and here in front of the school and along this direction as well. Just to give you some orientation, um, this, is, this being Henderson, you might remember that the loading dock was right here. So if you were looking at Mary Ellen Henderson, that area of course is gonna be redone, will be grassed and there'll be some trees there, but then right next to it will be a bioretention field. And that'll be important because this is a lot of hardscape in the one earth or the front area of the school. So as water sheets off that, it will move into this bioretention field or this bioretention field. And then over here next to the grove, there will be a bioretention area and then as, as well there. So we're really excited about that. Yes, ma'am. So, yeah. So, so the area for recess, am I not? Oh, is it not working? No, no. Oh, oh, for questions, right. Okay. Um, that's good. So I'll repeat the question since we didn't get it on, on tape. Um, so one of the questions was, uh, what if anything is gonna change on the middle school where the students go out for recess? So one, one thing you might know is, or might remember, is that this is where the cafeteria is right here. And there currently is a door that exits out the cafeteria onto this multi-purpose field. And there's also some blacktop area with basketball courts and the like. Those, of course, are going to be where the new school is going to be sited. So that, those areas will be gone. However, we will have a brand new multi-purpose field. We'll have four, I'm sorry, six, um, I think six hardscaped tennis courts that will be here that we may be able to use in multi-purpose ways, perhaps putting some temporary basketball courts there and the like. Um, so students, instead of playing on this side of the building during recess, will come out on this side and play out here. They can come out, they can come out the front and go this direction, and it's, and it's right there across, the, across this little area. Um, and, they'll all, yeah, and they'll also have access back on this side as well, right? Yeah. And kind of come out this direction and walk across this, down this trail, and we'll be able to get to those. From the loading? Yeah. yeah, so that's a gate there. This is the new loading dock for both of the schools. Um, so one of the things that we'll make sure that we do is to keep the pedestrian flow kind of out of that area. Um, so as students exit back in this area, there'll be a path that will kind of walk along these areas. And then as they come out the front, they'll cross this area here. But this is going to be a, a green space of some sort as well. We had talked about maybe hardscaping it as an additional area. And we're still sort of playing with some of those ideas as well. I think at one point it was called a middle school bonus space. Um, but one, one thing we, gotta make, we need to make sure of is that we have the appropriate permeable uh, area on the site. So it may end up being grass. A couple more things to kind of point out just as it's starting to come together. Um, to, again, this is the front of the school. This is the one earth area. Um, this is going to be a different kind of material than the paving material that you would see as you come along Mustang Alley. So once you hit this one earth area, you'll start to see some concrete changes, um, some special um, types of pattern, patterning will be in here. 
but it will clearly signify that this is the front of the school and this is where students will come in. Um, this is an area where students will walk up um, and, and this actually runs, this area runs all the way back to the 10 acre development. So students can walk up and through the 10 acre development and once they hit this area, they'll hit kind of this new um, type of material, be able to cross the one earth. And as they cross, um, they'll be crossing an area. This will be the pickup and drop off area for the buses. This is not the kiss and ride loop. Uh, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But as they come across this area, it will also be protected with these bollards that will move all the way along. And those are identified in sort of the lower right. Those, that's what the bollards will look like from, from a um, perspective of safety. Where you see these blocks, it's hard to see from where you're sitting, I'm sure. But those are uh, Socrates benches, they're called. And so there'll be a number of these benches strewn throughout so students can sit and have conversations. And then we have about 85 bike racks around the building as well. Um, to try to achieve as best we can the 1 to 15 ratio, roughly, of bike racks to, uh, to as well. And so some of them will be kind of in this area. Some of them will be back probably around in here. Uh, there will be some on the back side of the building. And uh, there will be some over by the uh, field entrance, I believe, off of Route 7 as well. Um, one piece that I want to, a couple of things I want to call out here. Um, this area is, we call it the Grove. Uh, and this grove area is, um, this dark space are where the donor bricks are. So all of the bricks that we've been able to um, document over the last couple of years that are currently at George Mason High School will be relocated to this area and will be part of the center of the grove. This will be all treed uh, as well. I anticipate that there'll be some benches in here. Um, there's a conversation that this might also serve as sort of the legacy garden area. Um, but it may not be, it may kind of be over in this area or it may be back over in this area as well, but it will be somewhere and it will be somewhere public where uh, people can walk through and be able to see um, all the legacy items that, uh, and, and many of the legacy um, items and people that have come through George Mason. I mentioned the kiss and ride. Um, this handle right here actually will serve as the kiss and ride for the high school. So this road actually comes up through <coughs> excuse me, the 10 acre development, parents will come in here, take a right and stop here and they can drop off right here into um, and short of the one earth and then students can walk across this direction and then head out this way. At one point, and, and by the way, this area will be blocked off also with bollards during um, the start and end of school so cars can't just drive up into Mustang Alley and take a left or take a right when buses are there and, and the like. So that's a big safety feature for us that's important to make sure that that's dropped off. At one point there was some conversation to um, perhaps have the kiss and ride inside the parking garage that's going to be built and we actually thought it would be better to separate that um, from the parking garage and the, and the reason for that is it just gets too confusing in that garage with 187 spaces with cars sort of circulating through and we have very few um, parents that actually kiss and ride at George Mason High School. Uh, and this would, be pr this would be specific to George Mason. It wouldn't be the kiss and ride for Mary Ellen Henderson. So we thought we could accommodate it here out front in a much better way. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, so having just come from a lacrosse game. Mm -hmm. that's, that's just for the team. Okay. Um, it, it will, so, you know, sometimes I will drop my kid off so they can hustle down to the field because yep. she needs to get there 45 minutes early. So would I do that? Is that how it would work on the weekends too? Is it the word be for sporting events? A couple of different ways you can, you can get to the fields. Um, you can also get to the fields here. And then you can also drop off on weekends. You can come down Mustang Alley. That, that won't be blocked off on weekends. So you can drop off here. And then this is the other entrance to the field. So that's probably the most direct access is if you were to come along here and drop off, a student would go down, and then they could hit the field down here, if it hit the field down here. Uh, if it's a practice lacrosse game, there's a very good chance they'll be using the multi-purpose field for practice as well. Um, so if you came in off of Route 7, you could come in through here, into this parking area, drop off here, and then you've got direct access to the field over there. Um, but there is nice access for, um, for parents to drop off and for kids to walk. One other piece that has come up in the conversation is what about coaches that have equipment? <coughs> and ha will coaches have access to the field? 
Uh, for example, if they need to drop off large lacrosse equipment, large softball equipment and the like. This area that's green that runs from here back to here and then from there back, these are grass pavers and they're, they're meant to be used for emergency vehicles. So for example, if an ambulance needed to get back to the baseball field um, out there in left field, they could, they could come along here and drive back this direction. We would anticipate that um, coaches that had large equipment that they needed to drop off would also be able to use that Mustang, Al, uh, Mustang Way uh, as well to drop off their equipment. And then they could also just drop it off here as well. So uh, lots of good access points to, to those spaces. Um, so let me move ahead. Um, a couple other, um, couple other things that you'll see. This is another piece that sort of identifies what trees are going to be used and where. Um, I kind of I shared that before, but again, this is a three, four, and a five. So here you'll see some bioretention planting, planting. You'll see some river birch, and then you'll also see some American elm in this area uh, to work through some of that stormwater management. This is the um, curve at the bottom of the ramp, um, right at the corner of the stadium field. Um, you might recall this is one of the tunnels, and this is the other tunnel that comes out of the bottom floor of the uh, building. This one goes directly into the arts area. This one goes directly into, um, I'm sorry, I have that backwards. This one goes directly into the arts area. This one goes directly into the um, dressing room. I had it right the first time, didn't I? Well, they, yeah. They both. they both go into the arts and, and PE areas. Just know that, locker room areas. Uh, but anyway, so those tunnels are there. And then there are some steps here down to the field. This, of course, is the, um, the, the stadium seating that's there. But here again, you'll see what are, what are we using in terms of materials. Um, so you'll see some of that same concrete that's in the one earth in the front of the school. And then you'll also see some of these uh, benches uh, along this way as well. So if students wanted to sit on the benches, they could sit on the benches and watch the game. Or we have a lot of parents that actually currently will stand on the sloped uh, path that from, the, from the top of the hill down to the bottom of the hill. Um, some, of the, some of that area will now have um, some benches for people to sit on as well. Um, so again, some of the other materials that we're using in terms of trees. Um, in the stadium bowl, that's this area that we're calling the stadium bowl. There will be grass, uh, but we'll also have flowering dogwoods, again, some perennials. Uh, and then these are all those red maples that will be bright red in the fall when students come to see us. Very quickly about the lighting. <coughs> um, as you're aware, the stadium field and the baseball field are remaining. Um, so that, those lighting um, stanchions will stay uh, where they are. Of course, the new building will have new light. The softball field, we have new lighting in the scope for the softball field. And right now, um, we have as an add alternate lighting for the multi-purpose field. Uh, we've been in contact with Danny Schlitt from Parks and Recreation, who has made a request in his capital plan uh, for some additional funds to help offset part of the cost for the stadium field or for the multi-purpose field because this field is used a lot by community use uh, but we also will be using it so we feel like we're a partner in that so we look at uh, we're trying to find a way to share the cost so that when we do open this building that that multi-purpose field will be lit yes <coughs> if, if there isn't funding for the lights themselves will the infrastructure be put in no matter what no matter what the infrastructure will be there. ridiculous if you don't we will not be ridiculous <laughs> <laughs> it will absolutely have the infrastructure there to be able to put the lights in if the funding for the actual light stanchions doesn't come through um, this is just a lighting plan that gives you some sense of these these uh, you can't tell what they are but they're little red um, areas that kind of show what the light casting will look like um, but more importantly, perhaps than that, as I'll scoot ahead, is the types of lighting that we're using. One of the uh, very strong advocacy pieces at the very beginning was to look at how do we use dark sky lighting. So the light fixtures that have been proposed are all dark sky lighting. Um, so the light will shine where it's meant to shine as opposed to all over. Um, and what's nice about it is you'll see the types of lighting fixtures that they've selected uh, from wall mount to pedestrian to road and parking are very similar in nature, so you'll get kind of a consistency across the property, uh, as well as these are the bollard lightings, uh, lighting structures that you'll find throughout some of the path uh, areas 
and around the building as well. Um, quickly, just a couple of elevations. This one is very familiar, I think, to everybody. This is kind of the most recent rendering. Um, what you'll see here is um, a couple of different types of brick. Um, this is sort of a multicolored brick, and it's meant to be multicolor uh, to begin to kind of match up a little bit with Mary Ellen Henderson so that it's uh, consistent uh, across uh, both buildings. Um, you'll also see um, sort of a, a different type of brick here, maybe a little bit larger format um, that gives a little bit different sort of feel to it uh, as it kind of comes up the building um, this direction. You'll also see, um, and you really can't tell here, but there is some metal, some metal panels in this look as well, uh, and some clear glass and some blue glass also to kind of help break up the facade a little bit. Uh, to really kind of keep it interesting. Um, again, the, just to remind everybody, this is the thin bar, the fat bar, and the heart of the school is right here. <coughs> um, and here is a better, here's a better look of it. So here's the brick that I was mentioning. Um, here's the different type of brick. It's a little bit larger format, kind of breaks it up a little. And then these are, I think these are metal down below. Daisy, I'm, I'm trying to remember, uh, right here. Yeah. yeah, so these are sort of metal. Uh, dark metal, and then uh, glass, and a little bit of blue glass that's uh, and spandrel spandrel glass that's put in there as well. And these are the bioretention areas that we were talking about. So any water that hits the one earth will kind of sheet off into these bioretention fields and be dealt with uh, differently through the storm water management process. This again, kind of as I was mentioning earlier, sort of the north side. Um, this is the west perspective. So there's been some question, what does it look like from um, the softball field? So if, if you're sort of standing where why it is now, um, you'd kind of be near home plate. This is the softball field here, minus the, the, um, the fence that will be back there. But it gives you, there was some question, like how close is that softball field going to be to the building? Um, this gives you a little bit more perspective. And then also there'll be a tree line. And I've, I've, I've said it publicly, and I'll say it again that any Mason girl uh, that hits a home run from the softball field is, and breaks a window gets $100 from me. Because <laughs> I, I, that's a long way. That's a, that is a shot to get to the field. Um, but anyway, uh, up here you'll see a patio. Um, this is the patio, you might remember, that comes right out of the cafeteria. Um, so as you exit the cafeteria, which is here, there'll be a, a chance to come outside and sit, and that will have outdoor benches as well. Um, and so that's, that's rather exciting uh, too. So just some quick things about the schedule. Um, we are again sort of in the design phase. Um, we have completed SDs. We are done with DDs. We're getting ready now to reconcile um, the, des the design development documents, not only with um, what they look like, but also uh, from a cost perspective. Gil Bain is uh, currently putting their estimate together based on the new design development documents. We also have hired a third party to give us an estimate uh, and see if those two match, because we just think it's good due diligence to have a third party also doing an estimate. Uh, and then we'll negotiate out kind of where we are. Uh, and they'll move into, uh, into construction drawings here. Those construction drawings will continue through groundbreaking um, but we will negotiate the guaranteed maximum price um, beginning, actually, we've, we've started a little bit. We've been exchanging a few documents uh, for execution of the, the GMP-1 at May 15th, and then execution of GMP-2 uh, in the July, July time frame, uh, July-August time frame. And they, Gilbane will start working through permitting structures uh, here in the city. Um, and they've actually started um, already submitted some documents. We will start the new school June. Uh, substantial completion of the building should happen by December of 2020, um, and maybe as early as the end of November, depending on the weather. Uh, and then uh, again, construction will continue all the way to August because once the school is done, then we'll complete the outside, we'll complete the fields. Uh, and then that final summer is the breakthrough summer because you'll, you'll remember that the, the new high school abuts the middle school, and we will be sharing a servery. So our, where we make our food and prepare our food will be together. Uh, and so we've got to make that final breakthrough in that servery area to uh, connect the two worlds. And we will be 
completed with the project in August of 2021. But that high school opening um, with substantial completion date in December is really exciting to us and uh, look forward to, to moving ahead with that. A couple of things to kind of keep on your uh, radar in terms of site plan approval. Um, we have gone to the Planning Commission. There's a resubmission for the second round of drawings that will happen on the 29th, <coughs> uh, or has happened on the 29th. Uh, they met, with, again, with the Architectural Advisory Board on March 6th, and a lot of what I shared with you today came from that. Uh, there'll be a second round of comments um, on April 5th. They'll do their resubmission and drawings for the third round. The 29th will be Planning Commission and a public hearing. And then on uh, May 6th, the school board uh, will take uh, action on the design documents uh, as they are now. And here's where we are with the building permit. So on the 18th of March, there were submissions of drawings given to the city, and we anticipate approval of those drawings in June. That is my story, and I'm sticking to it. So what questions do you have for me? Yes, Laura. Uh, <coughs> and I'm sorry, you might have uh, mentioned this. If we, if the high school opens end of December, November, December. The project's not fully complete till August. Do the students still move in in January, or do you wait till the August? We would anticipate that uh, as soon as we have substantial completion um, and the building is ready for us to move in, that we would use that winter break for us to move in. Similar to Mount Daniel. Similar to Mount Daniel. But, but the difference between Mount Daniel and the new building is that um, we are purchasing a lot of new furnitures, fixtures, and equipment for the new building, so there won't be a whole lot of movement of equipment and stuff from the old building to the new. Um, so we will, take, we will be abandoning some of the desks and the like, because many of them came with the building when it was built in 1950. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right, Lindy? Oh, yeah. <coughs> right. Including my painted bookcase. <laughs> <laughs> but good question. Yes. So uh, thank you for sharing about the landscaping. Um, will the, I know there's some roof terrace gardens. Will those have landscaping as well? Will that be part of it? Yes, on the, um, on the, huh, I'm trying to remember what floor Attention, it is. Attention, the back half of the gym is now closed for a private event. The back half of the gym is now closed for a private event. If you are here for open gym, you need to come to the front half of the gym. The back half of the gym is closed, thank you. I didn't even know you had a, an all call in here. That's pretty cool. So on the, on the second floor, there is a roof terrace that goes out in front that will have not only a concrete scaped area where people can stand and congregate, but there will be a vegetative roof as well. Um, so landscape, no, but vegetated, yes. Uh, and then on that same floor, um, there will also be a terrace that will go out along the uh, I want to say it's the north side of the building that kind of moves towards the back and that will be um, a project that we'll work on in the future. But it will be available to be on a sort of an outside area where students can congregate, people can congregate, but it won't be landscaped and it won't be vegetated. There may be some river rock and some things like that. And then on the, uh, on the fifth floor, there is the outdoor classroom and that will be, land, that will be landscaped in that there will be um, some vegetation out there. I don't know exactly what it's going to look like yet. Uh, we had a really great chance um, two weeks ago to go out to the Academies of Loudoun and visit, and they have on their roof a very similar uh, courtyard, not surprisingly, um, Stantec designed their building. A very similar size and scope of outdoor classroom on the fifth floor as ours. And so we got a chance to see what the solar tubes are going to look like that are going to be out there. And then there's plantings around those solar, tu solar tubes. And then there's also areas where students can sit and work. So it's, it is designed, um, and some of it's landscaped, but it's mostly designed for, um, for people just to kind of be out there and stand and, and sit. Yes. <coughs> the GMP question. OK. So GMP1 plus GMP2 equals the total price. Correct. OK. Yeah, GMP1. Um, is for some of the early buyout um, of materials of like steel and concrete that we want to make sure that we get in on early um, before any potential changes in, in pricing and cost. And then GMP2 takes care of the rest. <coughs> yeah, plus the 6.2 that we've already spent. 
So it's an amendment to that. Yes, Tom. I was curious about the baseball field. It's kind of run down, and I know we're not moving that or the football field, but is there any enhancements to either one of those, particularly the baseball field? Yeah, great question. Um, as a matter of fact, there was a meeting last week between the baseball boosters, um, some baseball parents, baseball coaches, um, Julie Braven from the high school, and also our um, staff from, um, from maintenance. And so right off the bat, we were able to identify two or three things that we want to take care of more immediately. So for example, the dugouts, making sure that we correct some of the drainage that's in the dugouts and put in some concrete floors in the dugout. Because right now, if you go into the home dugout, for example, it's, it's not concrete, it's dirt. Um, and so those are some things that we want to take care of more immediately. And then down the line, we do want to figure out ways to upgrade the facility to make it look more sort of in line with the building that's there. The other piece that we're looking at as well is, um, as an example, is the press box and the snack bar. Those, those two are not necessarily the most attractive things to look at on the back side next to this brand new high school. So we are looking at maybe doing something with that, but not immediately, um, but down the line. Does that include the restrooms? Um, it, it, we have the restrooms on the one side. Uh, we just redid the interior of the restrooms. The only thing that could potentially change was we might, would be that we might add more restrooms on the other side, but right now um, we're not planning to touch those. There was a goal uh, at the beginning of the building to design it for an energy use intensity of 22. I'm just wondering if that's still surviving the design process. I th I'm not sure what the new EUI is, Tim. Um, I think they're still working through the calculations, but. Um, I feel like that r remains the goal, and so we're going to continue to push to get there. All right, I took longer than my 20 minutes. I always do. Sorry, why? But you guys were here. You guys were here to hear about the high school, based on a show of hands. So I figure, <laughs> yes, Lindy. Yeah. Um, <coughs> okay. Uh, having been through many, many years of renovations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and. And I can hear Mary Beth knows what I'm going to say right now. Uh, value engineering. Um, <clears throat> it happened in the last uh, renovation of Mason and ended up putting really crappy products mm -hmm. in. And that didn't hold up well. Is there any thought that in the uh, future, if there is a need for funds, that you might leave some of the areas, you know, in the school unfinished to finish later? so that you just put the best of materials in no matter what. Yeah, so, so the process you're, you're suggesting is called core and shell. So essentially you build the core and the, sh and the shell, but you don't actually complete it. Um, I think with the budget that we have and the contingency that we've identified, um, I, think, I think we're in pretty good position as long as there's not a massive escalation of cost, um, which we're not anticipating based on the timelines that we have available to us. So, I think the materials that we're going to outfit this with are going to be of high quality. There are two areas right now on the third floor and on the fourth floor that are wide areas that are three classrooms in width right, right. that currently aren't going to be finished uh, in terms of becoming classrooms. There'll be large scale areas where groups of kids can gather and congregate. So if there is a need down the line for capacity, for example, we have six classrooms at our disposal at some point down the line to be able to utilize. Um, but we're doing more than core and shell with that. We actually are finishing those out. We're putting in the nice flooring. We'll do the wall treatments. We'll get the roof structure. We'll get the lighting and all of that. And just when you were talking about the baseball field, I haven't been up to a game yet because nasty weather. But um, in the perimeter around the backside of our property mm. and with the uh, drainage stuff and everything that's in the back and often the balls fly balls go down into that mess and I know there's a lot of poison ivy etc cetera, etc cetera. you know I don't know how well that's going to be cleared out and at least uh, you know just capable of being a little bit more accessible that you know where I mean right over to I do. Uh, to the behind the dugout I do. I, Home down, Kyle. I think we've had a last week really represented a nice beginning conversation with all of the people that needed to be around the table, um, with the baseball boost, with the athletic boosters, baseball parents, and coaches and administration. So I really 
am excited about the possibilities of bringing that facility up, um, up, up to snuff, Great. if you will. Great. All right. I'll turn it over to my friend Wyatt. So we will now shift um, and have our discussion geared towards the FY20 budget. And so we've just seen uh, pictures of the high school, which is in, uh, in detailed design right now. We have City Hall that's under construction right now. We have the Mary Riley Styles Library, which is in conceptual planning right now. These are all very expensive projects, and the City Council over the past four years has done a lot of hard things and asked the taxpayers to do a lot of hard things to build our financial strength to be able to accomplish these. And so the guidance for budget this year uh, was to maintain discipline on our operating budgets and not have any tax increase. And so that is uh, built into the budget that, is, that I'll present in just a moment. Uh, but for our, us to be able to achieve our financial goals and pay for the high school and the other capital improvements, we have an economic development project on the 10 acres um, adjacent to the new high school, which is really key to uh, the affordability of the new high school and the entire capital improvements program. But here are a couple kind of key points. Uh, discipline in our operating budgets, 2.4% on general government, 2.5% growth in the schools, no increase in the tax rate. We are going to dip into a permit fee reserve to bring on some additional inspectors for all the construction activity to make sure it is code compliant. But in short, uh, with our financing plan for the CIP, we're doing, we're, we're implementing the plan that we articulated to the voters in 2017 with the bond referendum for the high school. Um, a quick overview, again, the, the general government is growing just under a million, school transfer just about a million. We have a half a million dollars in new money going to WMATA. That's something we don't have a choice in. That's a contractual obligation. But the big one is a $4.27 million increase in debt service. And so when I talk about a lot of hard things we've done to get ourselves in a position to do that, we're going to be covering this increase in debt service with no increase in the tax rate in FY20 and no increase in the tax rate anticipated in the future if we execute the economic development uh, project that I'll describe. Our overall budget is just under $100 million uh, for FY20. So here are some of the key things the council laid out at the beginning of our planning process. And I won't read through them all, but I'll touch on some of those in the presentation as I go through it. But first, just sort of taking a step back, this is where our money comes from to run our government operations. 59% uh, of it comes from real estate taxes. Um, then all of these meals taxes and sales taxes all come from the commercial sectors, and that's really what uh, drives the city's uh, budget. And this covers both uh, our school budget and our general government budget. All of you all have received your assessment notices. They were mailed in February. On average, single-family homes grew 2.9%. Our biggest growth was in apartments an overall growth of 3.4% in assessed value. Um, our, the assessed value of the city is now uh, $4.28 billion. Um, and, and a chunk of that each year is from new construction, and, uh, and uh, the remainder is from market appreciation. The city's tax rate, we're showing it here in comparison to other jurisdictions in Northern Virginia. At a dollar thirty-five and a half, which is the current tax rate, which would be unchanged with this budget, we are generally in the neighborhood or below the, the towns and the cities um, in higher rates than the counties. I would have added some extra things that the counties charge, you know, for instance in Fairfax County with solid waste charges. That's built into their t and our tax rate, but it's, it's the equivalent of about uh, seven cents on the tax rate in Fairfax County. Uh, so tried to make it apples to apples uh, for these comparisons. With no change in the tax rate, there still would be an increase in the median homeowner's tax bill across the city. So the median homeowner will experience a $252 increase in their tax bill. And this shows you know, how that has been trending over recent years. Uh, the median home in the city is now just under uh, $700,000. 
This is where, uh, in the big picture, where our dollars go. Uh, the majority to education and then sort of around the horn uh, for all of the other city services that the general government provides. But kind of the headline for this uh, presentation is that historically the city's budget has been about six to seven percent dedicated to debt service. We're now growing that to 14 percent of the city budget is now going to debt service to cover uh, these projects and we still have that that builds in a, a major part of the financing for the high school but we have another step up that will occur in FY21 next year. Um, we do have uh, we put together a property uh, senior uh, tax relief task force this past year and so with the budget funds is option three we're going to have a work session on this uh, coming up in, in early April to go through the details of it but effectively, what we will do is expand eligibility for 100% abatement of taxes and also uh, expand the eligibility for deferral of taxes. Um, and we'll go through the details of that, but that, that came out from a task force recommendation. And overall, we will now have $390,000 as a tax expenditure, as it were, uh, for property tax relief for our seniors, um, disabled, and for veterans. Um, I'll go through these slides pretty quickly, but we do have new initiatives in the budget. We have an additional police officer that I'm recommending that we fund. That would bring our, our force to 33 uniformed <coughs> personnel. Um, doing our annual replacement of police vehicles is built into the budget. I mentioned earlier we would dip into our permit fee reserve. We have $900,000 from fees that we've collected from some of the major projects in the city. We would dip into that to make sure that we're staffed up to handle the construction projects in a code compliant way. In Founders Row, their fees will then go to recharge that fund so it's sustained. We are investing in our facilities and parks. Uh, we have on an ongoing basis $300,000 of PAYGO funds to take care of our buildings, not using debt, but um, uh, pay as you go. Uh, Fire Station 6. Um, has, has um, upgrades that are needed and then our parks we're investing $150,000 into our parks in FY20. Um, the downtown area, this has been a, a big area of, of uh, effort to try to make our downtown commercial areas more walkable and more attractive um, and working with our business community for that. Um, we also have a $15.7 million grant that we're using for transportation improvements around uh, the high school and the economic de development project immediately adjacent to the project. Transportation, a big area of growth in our budget has been us going out to the state and federal government for transportation grants and bringing that money home to work for our citizens. Uh, we'll have $636,000 for neighborhood traffic calming program next year that will be grant funded. Um, spot improvements of pedestrian improvements and sidewalk improvements of 100K, that's actually cash funded by our taxpayers. And then um, as we develop these grants, making sure that they're pre-engineered uh, before we, we submit applications so we can really execute on them once we get those grants. The budget contains a um, uh, pay improvement for employees, a merit increase of three and a quarter percent, and for the police, um, a 3.5% uh, increase in pay. Uh, two years ago, we cut the human resources director out of our budget and had our deputy city manager fill that role. Um, I'm recommending that we restore funding for that in the budget this year to meet that uh, need for our employees as, as a key resource uh, in recruitment and retention. Um, a few highlights of things we've just accomplished over the past year in the CIP. Uh, we've opened Mount Daniel Elementary School. Uh, we worked with Fairfax City on a joint firearms training facility that was opened about a month ago. The Van Buren Bridge, which was paid for with grants, the playground equipment, um, and uh, the Harrison Branch Daylighting, which uh, has, was just completed about uh, a few weeks ago. So these are the big ones that are wor we're working on right now in each of these projects. Uh, uh, we're in various different phases of them. All these capital projects are very complex. They have risks associated with them, and that's why we need to manage them very closely. 
Um, but obviously the high school project, which Peter just mentioned, uh, this is the, uh, a graphic of the City Hall project, which uh, we'll be moving back into City Hall uh, by the end of April, and we're looking forward to that. Uh, Mary Riley Stiles Library, that's a conceptual uh, plan, uh, but we'll be going into detailed uh, design for the, for the library very shortly. Big Chimneys Park. Uh, that's being paid for out of the land proceeds for the Harris Teeter building, and uh, that will get underway this summer, and the upgrades to the downtown plaza, which is being paid for by the EDA, will be completed this spring. So with the, the major, the sort of the big three uh, capital projects, our debt is growing. So we currently have $55 uh, million dollars in debt outstanding. And we're going to be stepping up to $195 million in debt outstanding. And we all just need to take a breath and appreciate that. That is, this is significant. Um, this will be by far the largest amount of debt in, in the city's history. And so when we talk about how we're, we're paying for it, um, the high school is obviously the, the major component of that. And we've been working on are planning for the high school now for about five years on how we will pay for it. Um, in the FY20 budget is the debt service for the first major issuance for construction of 63. We're anticipating about $60 million of debt will be issued um, this spring uh, and the debt service will come online in FY20. And then the second uh, piece will be issued next spring. So uh, that alone is about $6 million in annual debt service, and that would be about 15 cents on the tax, tax rate um, if, if we didn't have the economic development project to help pay for it. Sort of presented graphically as a share of our overall budget, this is the city hall and library uh, components of our CIP. And the blue bar um, is the high school components of the, of the CIP. This is 30-year debt. Everything else is 20-year debt. Um, and then the, the, bright, uh, the darker green is our existing debt on all of our other um, you know, projects that have been done over the past decade or so. So our plan of finance, or a big important component of our plan of finance uh, for the CIP, uh, with the new high school being built in this area, the old high school in two years will be turned over to a development team so that this very valuable uh, part of uh, a, a real estate can be redeveloped um, and we'll get uh, money from that transaction and then ongoing tax revenue from that economic development. That's been our plan of finance now for about four years as we've worked through this. And the planning really took off after the referendum in November 2017, with the schools going through your procurement process uh, that resulted in the Gilbane uh, construction contract in the city, doing the land use approvals, and then ultimately going to market to solicit proposals for an economic development partner. In November, we selected that partner, which is uh, the EYA, P.N. Hoffman, and Regency Center's uh, team. And we're now working uh, for uh, approval of an, an entitlement package for that development, as, as well as the comprehensive agreement on the business terms of that transaction. Um, if that is approved in May, and we're working very hard to accomplish that, then there are about 18 months where they'll go through a much more detailed site plan approval process, uh, get their building permits, and they would actually start construction after the new high school is complete, the old high school is vacated, and the land will be turned over to them. So when we're talking about the economic development piece, we're talking about starting in 2021. So the city is currently in an interim agreement with, uh, with their development partners. And that interim agreement just lays out some of the material terms, but also the schedule to arriving at a comprehensive agreement on, uh, in May, just, uh, just about a month from now. The basic business terms, uh, the overall land transaction is $34.5 million for phase one, a $10 million valuation for phase two, and then there are additional betterments for the city 
a shared parking garage, which uh, the, we believe the city will take that option. So that will grow the value in this range, and that price will be determined in the next couple of weeks. And then uh, if the issue, if the city were to stand up a community development authority to help with a portion of the financing of infrastructure, the city would get a credit for that as well. Then there are other financial agreements, profit sharings, and, and uh, capital event fees uh, that are built into the agreement as well. This is a kind of a quick look at the timing of, of, the, of the payments. So the, the $34.5 million uh, would all come to the city, stretched out over five separate payments uh, by the year 2024. Um, and then the phase two payment is uh, due before 2029. The development uh, project is, is in total about 1.4 million square feet of development and it's laid out in a conceptual plan that has as the principal commercial boulevard running uh, from Route 7 up to Virginia Tech and then ultimately to the West Falls Church Station. Uh, this would be lined by retail and by mixed use development with office, senior living, uh, a hotel and civic space, a grocer and uh, multifamily and condos, and then an office and, uh, and multifamily as well. Again, a total of about 1.4 million square feet of development. Now this application is going through all the board and commission's review right now. It's a very active time of really um, sort of looking and commenting on these proposals. But this is very conceptual at this point. This is a very high-level plan, and we'll have another 18 months to go through the details of what architecture would look like um, and, and exactly how it all will fit together. Um, but that plan has been presented to the rating agencies. Uh, we went to New York. We've really been briefing them on this plan for about four years, um, but um, the city does have very strong bond ratings, and. Um, and I think there's a lot of record of achievement in the city that backs that up. So the development approval process, we're looking for city council action on May 13th uh, for uh, council action on the special exception application and on the business terms that would be in the comprehensive agreement. Then we'd have an 18 month period for site plan approval and in 2021 again, that's when construction would start. Now with respect to the budget, um, we're looking for ultimately a, a council action on April 22nd on the budget and we have uh, public hearings on the 25th and on the 8th for uh, public comment on the budget. So that's uh, information that I had. I don't know uh, how I did on my time, but I appreciate uh, your attention. And are there any questions for me? Uh, what will be next is uh, Dr. Noon will talk about the school operating budget for FY20. But uh, before we get there, any questions for me? This question is really for Wyatt and for um, Peter. Um, I know you, right now you're working on the economic comprehensive plan, economic development plan. Um, there's been some talk around town that that may in, end up being delayed some. And I'm curious for Peter, question, part of the question to you is what, how would that delay impact the start of building the new school and then the, op the timing of the opening being able to move into that school what would the um, possible um, economic cost be to you? And then Wyatt also, what would be the economic cost to the city if um, that comprehensive plan is delayed some? Well, um, we're working very hard. You know, we've, we have had a basic operating principle from the beginning that uh, because of the importance of the economic development agreement on the financing plan for the high school, that we want to have that commitment and actual um, you know, signed agreements before we issue the big next tranche of debt for the high school. So that's the linkage between the two. Um, we're working hard to get that accomplished on May 13th. It's not going to be easy. These are complex agreements. Um, we'll have a, a page turn and a real briefing for the city council on April 8th. And uh, I think we'll have a good read at that point as to how we're doing in terms of nailing down all of the key points in our agreement. Um, and I think that's a major touch point for us. And I believe the schools are, are feeling very good about the schedule in terms of, of uh, 
your work with yeah. Yobang? I, I think, um, you know, if we're able to, to get the comprehensive agreement in place on the 13th and then be able to go forward with GMP-1 on May 15th, um, we'll be right on track for our project to be done with substantial completion of the building December 2020. Uh, if it were to slide, to your point, the, the tricky piece for us is that we're a school, and so our windows kind of goes back to Laura's question, I think, is the tricky piece for us as schools is there are certain times of the year that we can make a move. Um, so if there, if there isn't a move available to us over winter break, uh, we, can't, we can't move until the summer. So we would wait to make the move then until June. Um, so there would be a, a sliding of um, taking possession of the ec ec economic development site until June or July of 2021. So I think that's the biggest risk that um, we have, that we don't want to, we don't want to slow the economic development site down. Um, we want to get the developer that land as quickly as we can. Um, so we want to make sure that we meet these marks so that the developer can get the land in time. The, um, and the developers in Senate also, they, they, they have some points that they would really like to be able to get underway in, in the winter of 2021. And so I think there, there's an alignment of interest on that. If, if we do miss our mark because the business terms aren't agreed to, then um, I think probably one of the, you know, the, probably the biggest difficulty will be for the developer. Uh, the schools, if they move in, in the summertime, then that's, you know, that's, that can be arranged. Um, but uh, we're working hard to keep things on track. I will also note that the city does have a team of advisors. This is pretty co complex commercial real estate, uh, and the city does have outside legal counsel that does these transactions frequently, knows all the landmines, and we have a commercial real estate advisor on the, on the business terms as well. Um, and those are important uh, as, as we're doing these, these pretty high level, pretty sophisticated land, uh, land negotiations. Yes. Are there any specific updates on the library? Whether or not that's going to be delayed? Um, the library is, uh, they have a scheduled start of late summer and um, so they're going through their detailed uh, plans right now. The, uh, the way that's being procured is, is through uh, the architect and the construction team are working right now on, uh, on working towards I think 60 percent complete plans. Those will be reviewed by the library board, city council, and the community. Make sure they're on the right track and they'll be moving towards 100% plans in the summer and negotiation of the guaranteed maximum price over the summer. So that is, they are on, uh, they're on their schedule. They're, um, uh, you know, in terms of the way the CIP was laid out. Any other questions? All right, school budget. All right. Um, I think almost everybody in here, for the most part, has seen the school budget presentation. But I will, um, I'll run through it in my, what I would consider quick, and others might say, you took forever. Um, process, let's see. So this is now um, the advertised budget. So you might, might recall, just in terms of the uh, process that we go through on the school side, it's the superintendent's proposed budget, and then uh, the school board adopts the superintendent's budget, and then it becomes their advertised budget. And so today, what I'd like to share with you is actually the school board's budget, not, not the superintendent's budget anymore. So now it's the advertised budget. Um, the big things that I wanted just to make sure everybody um, knows and is aware of is that our budget um, is really aligned um, to our overall mission statement, and I won't read it to you, but um, it, it speaks to our, this notion of becoming the premier international baccalaureate school division in the country. And underneath that mission statement, there is a significant amount of work. And so we tried to graphically represent some of the work and what we 
call sort of the, the placemat, if you will. Um, and so here you'll see um, sort of at the top level, just below the mission statement, are our big goals of deploying best practices for teaching and learning, closing achievement gaps with an emphasis on special populations, and ensuring operational efficiency and effectiveness across the system. Um, those are the three things that as a system we are working on. And then at the school levels, um, who are part of the system, they become more refined in their work. And these pieces that they're working on at the school level tie directly back to these top three. So best practices in curriculum assessment and, and operations, um, working with teachers in collaboration, and then developing a caring community and climate is really important to us. And then there are some actions underneath that that they're taking. This placemat is designed to really follow closely our triennial plan. And in our triennial plan, it speaks to um, many of the things that were on the front page, but also gives a sense of what are the actual action items that will follow to complete the work of, of the school system. Just some quick information and data around our uh, school system. This comes from the school quality profile from the Virginia Department of Education. Um, some of the things to just really note are that we are fully accredited, um, which you would expect in the City of Falls Church. We are one of the best school divisions in the state uh, and certainly across the country. Um, our per pupil spending, about 86.3% of our total budget in spending comes from the state. Or, I'm sorry, comes from the locality, not from the state. And the reason that it comes from the locality is because our overall general um, sense of wealth, uh, or our overall general wealth in our community is high comparatively to the rest of the state. So our local composite index is very high. We serve 2,680 students, um, and our attendance rate is at 97% daily. So we're missing about 3% of our kids per day. Um, just some information about where we are with respect to our pass rates with standards of learning. These are not the best ways to measure um, our performance, but they are important to a lot of folks, and it's nice just to see comparatively to the rest of the state, how do we, how do we look, and we favor very well. Um, the Washington Area Boards of Education submits information about their gradu graduation rates. Here's Falls Church City. Uh, last year, 98.5% of our students graduated on time. Um, we know who the two kids are that um, we needed to, to get in, and they did have a summer graduation, so we had a 100% pass rate last year, um, which is a, a, big, a big milestone for a school system to be able to get 100% of your kids across the finish line. A couple of things just in terms of our IB program. 86% of our juniors are currently enrolled in at least one international baccalaureate course. 87% of our seniors are. This year, 51 students are seeking the IB diploma. Um, last year, there were 40 students, so we have more students seeking the IB diploma this year. Um, again, these are just good measures for us to kind of pay attention to, to, to see how we're doing with respect to international baccalaureate programming. Um, you might know that our elementary and our middle school programs are continuing to grow and to develop, thus creating a really significant pipeline for our high school programming. Um, and where those are developing are in our PYP ex exhibitions at the elementary school, the MYP projects um, at the middle and high school and the personal project. So it's the community project and then also the personal project. And some of you had some students in here that recently engaged in our personal project uh, work at our schools, and we're excited about that. Some of the other things that we do in our system, just to kind of pay attention to, you know, our outstanding robotics program, our champions of character, we are part of Odyssey of the Mind, uh, we do Math Olympiad and the like. A big driver in our budget this year, not just the triennial plan, but also remembering that we are building a brand new high school and that the voters were very kind to the schools uh, two years ago when they passed the bond for $120 million and knew when they, when they took that on what the um, impact was going to be from a tax perspective and we, wanted to, we want to really show some deference to that and be thoughtful about it. So one of the things that we really believe that we need to be is fiscally responsible while we're in the process of doing this work at the high school. Um, so, so to that end, um, what drives the vast majority of our budget is our enrollment. Um, and we get our enrollment numbers from the Cooper Center uh, down at the University of Virginia. It's a well-vetted organization. They actually, the state of Virginia uses the Cooper Center for the distribution of state taxes. Um, and this just gives a little bit of information about how the Cooper Center looks at data to uh, drive enrollment projections. 
And so here's our history of enrollment projections. And I share these with you because I think that they're important for a couple of reasons. One is there's clearly an upward trend. Um, and we need to kind of continually be cognizant of that. Um, but the other is to show what the blue line is. The blue line is our projected enrollment, and the red line is our actual enrollment. So you'll see that there have been a couple of times where we've been projected high and come in low, and there have been other times where we've been projected low and come in high. Currently, we've, for the last two years, we've come in lower than our projections, and that's important because it means that right now we have more staff than we need for the number of students we have. And this gives us an opportunity this year, as we look at next year's projection, that's starting to more mirror this line, sort of trending sort of more of a flat line than, than going up. It gives us an opportunity to really revisit um, what is the right size of our staff and faculty here in the City of Falls Church to meet the needs of our students while still maintaining the high quality of education that our community uh, expects and, and keeps those class sizes small as well. So, um, as we think about that, the other thing that we also have to pay attention to is what kinds of services are we providing to our students? And I shared this slide with the community during the presentation because I think it's important to note that in our, our LEAP population, which, are, which is our students who are learning English, that population of students has grown by 12% year over year from 16, 17 to 17, 18. Our students who are in poverty, these are students who take up services for free and reduced lunch and breakfast has increased by 11%. Our special education students have increased by 6%, yet our overall total enrollment in the same period of time has only increased by 1%. So that means that our population or our special populations of students that need extra services are growing disproportionately to the over, uh, overarching population of our schools. So our demographics are changing slightly here in the City of Falls Church, and that's important to note and, and really a good reason for us to maintain a good focus on high quality instruction. Our cost, cost per pupil um, this current year uh, in the proposed budget, in the proposed budget, sorry, next year, is actually slated to increase by about 608 students to about $19,000 per student. Where is that in relation to others? This is us right here. And the number one reason that our cost per pupil is as high as it is is because we've made a commitment in this community to staff our early elementary at 22 to 1 and our, and our older students at 24 to 1. If we were to change that ratio and staff, say, exa for example, 24 to 1 at the lower elementary and 26 to 1 at the upper levels, that cost per pupil would come down rather dramatically because it would mean that we would need less teachers than we currently have. But based on the current planning factors that we use, and the, um, the per pupil ratio, um, we do have a pretty high per pupil cost. So our budget approach, approach this year really was rooted in some of that sort of context, but our number one piece was we wanted to look at employee compensation. It's our humans that make the most impact and have the most impact on the students we serve. Um, and here you'll see that uh, 80, what is that, 84 percent of our overall school budget is expended in salary and benefits. That means that 84% of our budget is in people. Um, we have a very small percentage in transfers and revenues and a small percentage in logistics. Um, and then this is where the money comes from. So you'll see, again, uh, between beginning balance, some fees and others, and the local transfer, the vast majority of our budget comes from lo the locality. A very small percentage, 1% roughly, comes from the federal government and about 13.6% comes from the state. So we rely really heavily. This sort of just describes the pie chart that I just shared. Um, but here, just to give you a sense of overall numbers, our projected total from the Fed, uh, federal revenue is about 586,000. Um, and then from the state, um, we are looking at a decrease based on what we anticipated. Our overall will increase, but it's less than what we thought it was going to be. So our increase is going to be about 2.8% from the state, which means that we count heavily again on our locality. So going back to December, we were given a 2% guidance or organic growth from the general government and from the city council. Um, and at that time, that 2% represented about $844,000, uh, which was our starting point. Uh, the general government agreed to pick up the funding obligation for WMATA 
And then if that funding obligation for WMATA were less than $300,000, um, that anything less than that would be shared at 50%. And then any additional revenue beyond the 2%, um, which would then represent organic growth, would also be shared at 50%. So it gave us a good starting point. Um, and what, what we've requested um, was the 844,000, the 2%, um, and also the additional 50% of anything above that in organic growth. And right now that sits at about $200,000 extra coming to the schools um, above that 2%, and we're very pleased with that. So there's, again, our, the focus for us was compensation. So here you'll see that everyone uh, in our system that is eligible for a step increase, and that's uh, the vast majority of our, of our teachers and uh, professionals and, and also our support staff, will get an increase of 2.95% through that step process. And then we're also looking at giving a 1% market scale adjustment. So on average, the average employee this year will get about a 3.95% increase uh, over last year. Additionally, we want to bring up the pay for our substitute teaching core. Um, we do, Lindy, Lindy's excited, our, one of our number one substitutes. Um, increasing it by $2 an hour for short and long-term substitutes, we know that uh, we do struggle getting substitutes, and we think that pay has something to do with that. So this number gets us closer to um, what the regional average is. Uh, we were projecting health insurance rates increasing at about 10%. We've gotten some good news in that. Um, we're not sure exactly what that looks like, but we've gotten some good news that it doesn't look like it's going to go up as much as 10%. Um, and then uh, we're also going to um, make some contractual adjustments for our school nursing services and grounds maintenance. So when you take all of those together, that exceeds the $844,000 or 2% that the city council and general government has said they'll transfer to the schools, which means that we have to do some realignment. And the major realignment comes from um, a few areas. The first is salary turnover. So we're going to be able to recognize about $185,000 of money that has been captured through salary turnover. So if a teacher uh, for example, leaves in April, and we don't fill that position for the rest of the year, that amount of money that's not spent on that teacher, less the amount that we pay for the substitute, is then captured in salary turnover. Um, and so as we look across our system, we think that we're going to be able to recognize about $185,000. Additionally, there's some other post-employment benefits that we pay. So some of our employees that have been with us for a while um, are eligible for um, health care, for example, until they meet Medicare eligibility. Um, and so we have some folks that are going, coming off of our roles and going on to Medicare, so we anticipate that we'll have about a $71,000 savings there. Uh, we had a, a transitional retirement plan in 2002-2003 that was one year only, so if you had a minimum age of 45 and five years of satisfactory uh, work and made a decision to leave, you would also get a stipend, um, and this represents some of the, um, those folks that are eligible for that stipend or are not part of, our, uh, part of our payment process anymore. But the big move for us to capture the most savings is that realignment that I was talking about with staff. So we are looking at cutting about five positions across the system to right size, if you will, the system. And that'll save us about $465,000 between salary and benefits. Again, we're not going to impact um, our, our planning factors, uh, and we plan to do it all through attrition. So for example, we, we do anticipate reducing one kindergarten teacher and one kindergarten para next year at Mount Daniel, uh, but those kindergar that kindergarten teacher and that para will have another position somewhere in our system. So we don't anticipate having to send anybody out of the system uh, through a reduction of force action. Um, we also are going to be able to realize about $100,000 in savings. Um, as you may have heard, our central office is moving to 150 South Washington, um, and so some of the savings that we'll capture in the first year um, is going to be recognized as part of this logistical reduction, which will help us balance the budget as well. Um, we, as I mentioned, we are uh, looking like we're going to have about $200,000 additional funding through the organic growth and so some questions have come up, how are you going to spend that money or how are you considering spending that money? And because we are doing such a reduction in staffing um, to meet our budget needs based on our enrollment projections being lower than we anticipate, 
we really feel like it's important that we have some sort of staffing reserve in place in case enrollment spikes. Because as you recall from that, from that chart that I showed, there are some zigzags in there. And there are times that we have underprojected and overenrolled, just like there have been times we've overproject, underprojected and under overprojected and underenrolled. And so in, in the case where we perhaps have over uh, underprojected, I'm sorry, overprojected and underenrolled, the opposite of that. Over underprojected and overenrolled, and we're cutting people, we need to have some money in reserve so that if, if kindergarten numbers, for example, come in bigger than we anticipate and we have to put that teacher back, we have some flexibility and capacity to do that. So we are going to put some money in the staffing reserve to do that, um, but we also are going to use some of the $200,000 to offset the reduced amount of money that we uh, are going to get from the state. And so between that, those two things, we feel like we're going to be positioned really well uh, moving forward. Um, this just has sort of highlights what we were talking about before. Um, this here talks about the revenue increases um, that we are looking at, and then these are the expenditure adjustments that we're making. Um, and, and again, I've been through all of these line items uh, in terms of expenditures and revenues in the presentation. And then some update uh, on timing. Uh, March 24th is today. We're doing the Sunday series. Tomorrow will be a public hearing. Um, and, and that, why, where does that happen, the city's first public hearing? It will happen here tomorrow. And then on April 8th, there'll be a second public hearing right here in this room. Uh, April 22nd, the City Council will adopt uh, the budget ordinance, which will include the school transfer amount in that. And then on May 7th, uh, we will have another public hearing on the school board side, have a budget work session, and then we'll adopt the final budget in, uh, for 2020 at that May 7th meeting. And that will be, if we're back in City Hall, it'll be at City Hall. Um, and I think we're on target to be there, so excited about that. Um, this presentation and this budget uh, was also done for the PTA uh, at all levels, the elementary, middle, and high school PTAs, and they unanimously supported the school's budget. Um, it has been presented to the City Council. Aaron Gill, our chair, presented it to the City Council. Uh, the conversation was very positive um, because we came in at the 2% mark and we are able to dovetail very nicely, I think, into uh, the overall city budget this year. So with that, um, I'll stop. And do you have any questions about the budget? Meant to, it was meant to be boring. <laughs> Nothing to see here. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, great. Well, thank you for indulging me in the budget. Um, I'm wondering if there's anything else for the good of the order here, because those are our presentations that we've prepared for you for today. A word of thanks. Kieran Bawa is here, our CFO. Yes. And uh, Kristen, CFO. Michael. Kristen Michael is here as well, and uh, two of them um, really created the materials that you've seen today and uh, are personally responsible for the budgets for each of the city and for the general government and the schools. So thanks to both of you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. All right. Well, let's go outside. <laughs> <laughs> the most peaceful budget season. I can... All right. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>